the Bay Area father talks about the time he spent in jail for a crime he did not commit. Good evening, I'm Brendan McLaughlin. And I'm Marty Tucker. The Action News investigators uncovered the story of shocking mistakes made by the former Pinellas Pasco County medical examiner, Joan Wood. Last night we told you about Wood, who was forced to retire two years ago after prosecutors charged her with mishandling a sensational murder case involving the Church of Scientology. That case made national news after Wood reversed her decision on the death of Lisa McPherson, who died in the church's care. Now, Action News investigator Mike Mason has uncovered even more, maybe more serious mistakes. Right, this is a horrible story and it could happen to any parent. We already told you the story of David Long. Well, while investigating his case, another innocent man, John Peel, was also released from jail. He had been locked up for four and a half years. Unimaginable mistakes by Dr. Joan Wood led a jury to convict him of killing his own child. So how could Wood make such a big mistake? Well, we did a little digging to find out who watches over the state's medical examiners. When John Peel goes to work each morning, he's doing more than renovating a home. He's rebuilding his life. At the young age of 18, he was sent to jail for murdering his baby boy. But he didn't do it. He was my son. I loved him more than anything in this world. John would often fall asleep while holding John Jr. One day he woke up to find his baby dead on the floor. It's hard. You know, nothing's going to bring him back. You know, I wish I could. At the time, the medical examiner for Pinellas and Pasco counties was Joan Wood. She determined the baby was murdered, a victim of shaken baby syndrome. John was arrested and convicted of first-degree murder. But after spending four and a half long years in jail, the new medical examiner discovered Wood made a big mistake. In my opinion, his baby was not um, murdered, certainly wasn't shaken to death. John Thogmartin is the new medical examiner for Pinellas and Pasco County. He and four other pathologists reviewed John Jr.'s autopsy report and found major discrepancies. For example, in Joan Wood's microscopic examination, she writes, there is no retinal hemorrhage or no bleeding in the eyes. But in another part of the report, she contradicts that, writing she did find gross retinal hemorrhage. Clearly from reading the testimony of the doctors involved, the um, opinions regarding whether this was shaken baby or abusive head trauma was based upon the fact that there was retinal hemorrhage when there was not. We confronted Joan Wood at her Clearwater home. John Peel Jr. was a baby's name. Um, it was back in 1998. I, I don't know anything about that. When we told Wood more about the case, she refused to comment. That's uh, my attorney's advice. And I really, um, I get panicky when I get around cameras and so I'm, I'm really better off just not talking. In the past, our cameras never seemed to bother Wood, who represented herself as an expert on shaken baby syndrome. It's like this. Wood was a chief medical examiner for 18 years and helped prosecute at least six cases of shaken baby in the past 10 years. In recent months, prosecutors found two of those fathers were wrongly accused. Both John Peel and David Long were then released from jail. So why didn't anyone question Joan Wood's findings? Shockingly, Action News found she was the chairperson of Florida's Medical Examiner's Commission. That commission regulates medical examiners. She held that position for six years, essentially regulating herself. Certainly, I think Joan Wood's Wood should be exposed for what she was and is. Which uh, is? An incompetent physician who should never have held a position for the length of time that she did. Attorney Norman oh, no. Canella represents John Peel. You know, if John Wood done this to me, I'm sure she done it to other people. John Thog Martin is double checking. In the meantime, he can only promise this won't happen again. I um, would apologize to uh, John Peel for my, on behalf of my profession. The Medical Examiner's Commission tells us it has never received a complaint against Joan Wood that has risen to the level of an investigation. Wood has gone on to open her own practice as a medical consultant, so she is still practicing medicine. The men you saw in our report now plan to file complaints with the Board of Medicine, and that and a lawsuit are really all they can do. The Action News investigators found a family ripped apart.
For thousands of Cuban Americans living in the Bay Area, freedom has a price. Some made it to the U.S. floating on rafts through shark-infested waters. Others, like the Pisanos, had their families torn apart. Tonight, the agonizing heartbreak of a Tampa man desperately trying to get his daughter out of Cuba before she dies. Action News investigator Mike Mason recently traveled to Havana, has the story of this family that's been trying to make this reunion happen for 22 years now. Right, this wow. is a very important story about how hard it is to get a family member out of Cuba. Yeah. Cecilia Pisano can hardly remember what life with her family was like. She was just a little girl when her father was forced to leave her behind in Havana. They never thought Fidel Castro would let her leave Cuba to join them in Tampa, but now they're dealing with a cruel twist of fate. It's not Castro who's keeping the Pisanos apart. I want to see you. I miss you very much. Tata hugs and kisses with my sister and brother. Cecilia Pisano has been holding on to hope for more than two decades. She was only eight years old when her father was forced to leave her behind in Cuba. I used to go everywhere with dad. He used to take me to the county fair. I loved going there. Separated only by a few hundred miles, Cecilia and her father are still worlds apart. She lives in Havana. He calls Tampa home. Cecilia prays they will one day be together. Yes, I want to leave Cuba. I want to see my dad. I want to be with him. Don't worry, Dad. I think everything will work out fine. Cecilia's father, Roberto Pisano, was forced to leave Cuba after spending 18 years in a political prison. Then President Jimmy Carter negotiated his release in 1979. When Roberto came to the U.S., Cecilia had to stay behind in Cuba with her sick mother. But two years later, her mother died from kidney disease and chronic diabetes, leaving Cecilia all alone. Today, Cecilia has an eight-year-old son. She has also developed the same illness that killed her mother. It's treatable in the U.S., but if she stays in Cuba, Cecilia may not live to see her father again. I love you, Dad, very, very much. The same as I love Mom. The emotional pain is overwhelming, but Cecilia copes with physical pain as well. Her chronic diabetes causes severe inflammation in her legs, slow circulation, and poor eyesight. She must inject insulin four times a day to regulate her blood sugar, and if she misses a single dose, she could die. Cecilia's family sends her insulin every month. She says when she uses the insulin from the Cuban government, it's not very good, and that's why she still feels sick. If I don't have the medicines that my dad sends me, it's hard for me. I depend on that to live. Sometimes, Cecilia's supply of insulin arrives too late, and she goes into diabetic shock, confining her to a hospital for days. Her son then has to take care of himself, and finding food is not always easy. Do you think you have enough um, food to survive? This piece of pork costs nearly one U.S. dollar in Cuba. That's 20% of Cecilia's monthly income. When we visited a local market with Cecilia, workers there saw our cameras and ordered us not to take any pictures. No filming. They don't want you to film. That's what they've been told. This market supplies the entire neighborhood with monthly rations. Workers carefully measure every gram of food that is given out. Each person here gets one pound of beans per month. This is what one pound of beans looks like. Mike, uh, Mike, uh, Cecilia says that uh, we should, we should no, no, no. No. At that moment, Cecilia became frightened and felt compelled to leave the market. So we did. That night, she called Tampa to speak with her brother, Rafael. She called us late that night around uh, 2 in the morning, sometime late at night, and told us that the secret police went over there and told her that if anything were to get out that made the regime look bad, that it would cost her and possibly time in prison. Cecilia now worries she'll be retaliated against because she spoke with us. Tomorrow night, you'll be surprised to learn who has been standing in the way of Cecilia coming to the U.S., and I can tell you it's not the Cuban government.
So she's able to talk with them on the phone, uh, the relatives who live here in Tampa. Yeah, there's actually one phone in the entire neighborhood. There's one phone per mm -hmm. block, so she has to go and ask her neighbors if she can use it. All right, well, we're anxious to hear how this... Uh